Welcome everyone to this webinar on human capital management and COVID-19. Um, this is ACCR's sort of guidance for engagement on kind of workforce issues in the 2020 AGM season. Um, I'm the Director of Workers' Rights, Katie Hepworth, and we're joined today by Miriam Thompson from the Cleaning Accountability Framework and Ange, who's the security guard at Brisbane Airport. Uh, we were meant to have a warehouse worker join us as well, but he's currently facing company retaliation in exchange for actions that were taken to um, bring in WorkSafe um, at his work site. So I'll be speaking on his behalf. Um, so before we begin, um, I want to take a minute to acknowledge that I am recording and hosting this meeting from the lands of the Kadigal people. I also acknowledge the tra traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today um, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters here in New South Wales, but also all over this land that is known as Australia. Um, so today, um, this webinar, as you can see on the screen, is around human capital management. Um, and in particular, we were looking today at the way in which companies choose to organise their workforce um, and how this impacts um, and increases risks or mitigates risks to both workers, but also to the broader community. Um, ACCR released a series of guidance uh, a little over a week ago that is uh, aimed at helping investors sort of engage with companies on workforce issues and kind of provides a kind of series of questions that can be raised to companies around those issues. Um, it's taken a lot um, of analysis from the Melbourne second wave, but um, as the name sort of suggests, we've also taken, um, we need to sort of pay thanks to the Human Capital Management Coalition uh, in, the, in the US um, and the work that they've done around these issues in the US COVID um, and AGM season. Um, so, since May 20, since March 2020, a key focus of ACCR's work has been on the impacts of COVID-19. So like many of you, we've kind of been focusing on the impacts, but we've looked specifically at the impacts of workers and on workers' rights. We've produced a series of briefs over that period. Um, and initially we were really focused on the role of responsible business in mitigating kind of the effects on workers when industries were shutting down and how responsible business would use bailout and stimulus packages. But what we've seen since then is that the second waves in Australia, like elsewhere, are really tied to uh, insecure work um, and the particular kinds of uh, a number of factors that are linked to insecure work. So we began to track company and media reporting in a bunch of essential industries. Now, the industries that you see on the screen and the listed companies on your screen are obviously not all essential industries, but they're the ones that we've been focused on across the year uh, to look at. And really um, what we've been doing is working across civil society um, and the investment sector here in the US and the UK to kind of understand the various impacts and risks associated with COVID. Um, so what we're looking at today, um, it's probably no secret, particularly for most of the people in the Australian investment sector located in Melbourne, um, that Dan Andrews very early on in the second wave acknowledged that insecure work was linked to 80% of COVID transmission in Australia. On the right, you've got a map of COVID transmission from of active numbers of COVID cases in Melbourne um, from around July 2020. And that mapped quite closely to areas of disadvantage and numbers of casual work in, um, in Melbourne. Now, the things that have been focused on to date have been on people's ability to take leave um, and whether or not they're able to stop work. Um, so the access to any kind of leave, but in particular paid pandemic leave, and whether or not they have to, they are able to afford to self-isolate the other stuff that has come to our attention is the numbers of casual workers that are um, compelled to work more than one job because they don't earn enough money in a single workplace due to low wages, but also casualisation and part-time work. Um, and the fact that the government had to bring in place laws to actually, or regulations to make workers and their employers um, uh, cover the work that they're doing on only one site. But I think, Again, another aspect that has kind of come through, but is probably less 
vocal and visible in a lot of ways, unless you look for it, is on labour hire. And the role of subcontracting and indirect employment more broadly in COVID transmission. So in May 2020, ACCR published a report on labour hire and contracting risks across the ASX 100. Um, that report was published in the, like right in the beginning of the pandemic, but it was conceptualised well before the pandemic started. And it highlighted a number of risks um, that are associated with labour hire and subcontracting, um, including poorer oh &S outcomes, confused lines of responsibility between employers and um, host companies, um, and sort of lacks of reporting. Now, even though it was conceived of and developed well before COVID, it was launched in the middle of the pandemic and a lot of the risks that we highlighted um, in that report have come to play out. Um, there's just a select number of sites where we know that subcontracting has paid, played out and played a key role in COVID transmission down the bottom there. So it's Downer, the spotless laundry um, situation, Cedar Meats, uh, the coal warehousing situation in Melbourne and hotel quarantine. I'm going to talk a bit about hotel quarantine. I'm happy to talk about the Downer and Spotless situation and also about Toll Kmart. If people are curious about Downer and Spotless, we can get to that in the question times. Um, I should flag, because I didn't do housekeeping before, that if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in uh, the Q&A, um, or you can raise your hand and we'll, um, we'll take those questions later. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take questions at the end with the exception of questions for Angie, because Angie's gotta jump off and head to work. Um, so we thank her for being here today. Um, so just to get back to labour hire and why and subcontracting and why it's risky. Um, what you can see there is what we understand labour hire and contracting to be, which is a triangular employment relationship. So you have a host firm that has a contract with a labour hire agency to provide labour. The labour hire agency is the employer of a worker and the worker performs work for the host firm. This is the simplest version of the labour hire and subcontracting arrangement, but it can get much more complicated than this, as we're going to hear about in the security and cleaning sections. So I'll let people speak to that. Okay, so commercial security in Australia. Um, what does it look like? Um, so what we know, and it's become really clear in the quarantine inquiry, is that it's an industry that has been associated with below minimum wage payments and poor job security for a really, really long time, for decades, in fact. Um, it's associated with the poor treatment of workers. And the reason for this is it's an industry where you have, um, if you take Victoria, for example, almost 100% of private security in Victoria is provided by um, contracting firms where there are multiple layers of subcontracting arrangements and labour hire within that. Um, you have a proliferation of sham contracting arrangements and you also have, um, I guess, low barriers to entry. So you may have someone that just has a mobile phone or is contracting people via, via WhatsApp and there is no trace of who they're working for. So what's come through and this became the risks associated with this work model um, have been known for a long time. Like it's at high risk of modern slavery. There's lots of illegality and labour exploitation. But in the case of quarantine um, security, um, we can see that what it's led to is the second wave breach with huge economic consequences. So all of the breaches in Melbourne, have, uh, the current second wave are being tied back to hotel quarantine security. Um, and that's just some of the stuff that's come out through the inquiry there. Um, that workers were only provided five minutes of training and infection control procedures. They were forced to lie about whether or not they'd been given proper training. They weren't given proper PPE. And you had sole contractors employing workers who'd had no security experience um, and those people have been brought in because they were cheaper than security guards with greater amounts of experience and more training. Now, I wanted to get Angie in today because um, there's a lot of issues on the site at Brisbane Airport that she can talk about in terms of wages and conditions, but it is one of the places where the workers together have um, managed to get rid of subcontracting arrangements. So I want to kind of flick over to her to kind of give her experience of COVID and in general, the security industry. Um, so thanks, Angie. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for allowing me to take this opportunity to speak here today. My name is Angelia Brandon, and I've worked at the Brisbane Airports for 18 years as an aviation protection officer. My duties include x-ray screening of not only the checked baggage, 
but also the screening of passengers that travel both internationally and domestic. It's not a glamorous job, uh, it is shift work. That means we are starting our shifts in the wee hours of the morning, like at 3 a.m., or we could be finishing at six o'clock in the morning. It is a difficult lifestyle to live. Our health usually suffers doing the shift work. Rosters are not, uh, rosters for this kind of work are never usually in the favour of the worker. It usually always suits the contractor. So you could be rostered to work six, 10 or 12 hour shifts uh, in the early hours of the morning in a row and then get two days off to recover and then back for six night shifts. Sleep depri deprivation is the most common thing we all suffer with due to it. Bad diets due to working hours and uh, causes health issues also. Myself personally, I took six months off last year to work on my health. Uh, over the many years of shift work, it finally took a toll and I saw the difference once I stopped doing those crazy shifts. My body clock reset and sleep better hours and I'm eating at regular times and it makes a huge difference to your health. There are two main reasons why we do this job. One, obviously it's a job uh, and it pays the bills. Like everyone else, we need to live. So that's firstly. But two, we love the work. The truth is there is a great sense of personal pride and reward for us. The job consists of detecting dangerous goods and items inside bags through the use of CT scanners, X-ray machines, explosive trace detection machines. It involves very strict regulations that we must abide by um, and we are constantly tested by regulatory bodies to assure that we are doing our job correctly. This alone can cause great stress um, upon our staff, let alone the job itself. Knowing that you're trying to keep lives safe whilst they are flying. Over the years, uh, sorry, it is, let alone the, oh sorry, where am I? It is a highly skilled position and those skills are not recognised if you look at our pay. Over the years, the training has improved and that was due to the workers at the health of our union identified the training issues. Um, there are many styles of security work for security officers, from guarding buildings or equipment, traffic control, CCTV monitoring. Security is a contracting industry, and most times the con company that wins the contracts has come in with the lowest bid to the tender. Unfortunately, those cuts to the bid will almost certainly be at the expense of the workers. Often it can mean a security officer can work at the same location for 20 years, change uniforms six times, and not have long service accrued. I personally have worked for 18 years and changed uniforms multiple times at the one place. When a new contractor comes in, often wages and or conditions can be subject to change. And that usually is never to the benefit of the worker ice also. Most security officers could also be kept at permanent part-time, even though they may constantly work hours that are similar to a full-time worker. We have seen subcontracting become a huge issue in other parts of the security industry. Personally, we've fought to protect the workers at airports from subcontractors through our EBA negotiations. This is important to our staff in regards to job security and wage growth. When the COVID hit, it felt like our company was slow to react with providing us masks. Um, many of the staff were discouraged from using the masks because it may give the passengers the wrong idea. Perception seemed to be more important, you might say. This caused staff to be stressed and some of them had compromised health. It was expected by our officers to conduct touch point cleaning with, um, of the screening points and the trays that you put your objects in. Um, even though we were never trained in cleaning, using cleaning equipment, the contracting company, cleaning company that was at the airport had stood down most of their staff. So at the time, at the most important time when we needed professional cleaners, we were asked to do it. As you can expect, we fought to have this addressed. And so our company hired professional hygienists for 10 weeks to conduct the COVID cleaning required. In summarising, it's the insecurity in security that impacts, impacts us all physically as well as economically. 
those things may seem small to some, but this could be the difference that security officer applying for a house loan or such. I hope you have a better understanding of how our lives are affected due to shift work and the contracting industry. Thank you. Thanks very much, Angie. Um, if anyone has any questions for Angie, I just ask to quickly put those in the chat. Um, and while I'm waiting for them, just want to summarise that um, thanks for sharing that stuff around subcontracting. And in particular, I think it's important for us to understand um, the way in which uh, the workers have championed themselves um, to get additional training. Um, and also in light of the risks that we've seen in recent times and the high risk to national security that we see in the airport um, that you've put in place mechanisms to stop the kind of levels of sub subcontracting and allow sort of that transparency throughout the supply chain and where like with all the security guards that are working on the airport. So that's good to see. Um, Angie, I know you've got to jump off, um, so I'll let you do that. Um, and thanks to that. If anyone's got any other questions for Angie that come in later, feel free to send them through and we can kind of pass them on. Um, Great. So the issues that we see in um, security are very similar to a lot of the issues that we see in cleaning. Um, we've got high levels of outsourcing since the 1980s um, and a fragmented industry with contractual pyramid and supply chain structures. Similar to security, it's got low barriers to entry and you've just got a proliferation of thousands, um, tens of thousands of um, clean contractors and subcontractors in Australia. Um, like security, it's one of the highest risk industries for modern slavery, but um, be above and beyond that, it just is a place in which below minimum wage payments are common and endemic. Um, and that we've seen in recent years, and part of the reason for this is work intensification and a failure to actually recognise the number of hours that cleaners are working to keep our buildings clean. Um, I've got Miriam here from the Cleaning Accountability Framework that's going to reflect on the work that they've been doing um, prior to COVID, but also what they're seeing um, in buildings um, pre, um, in response to COVID and particularly the work that they're doing with property investors and building owners. So thanks, Miriam. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for the invitation to, to speak today. Um, so the three key, key points that I'll be focusing on today uh, the fact that COVID-19 has exacerbated some structural issues that were pre-existing in the cleaning industry and that, um, as Katie mentioned, have been, have been going on for, for decades now. So similar situation to the security industry. And I'll talk through some of these pre-existing structural problems. Um, the other point is that COVID-related cost cutting at the top of the supply chain is placing even more pressure on an already vulnerable workforce. Uh, the third point is that where the top of the supply chain, so where investors and building owners engage productively with cleaning contractors and provide a space for cleaners to speak up, cleaning services can be delivered to a high standard and cleaners' rights can be, res can be respected. And so I'll talk a little bit about what we've seen in terms of good practice. So to begin with, I'll talk about some of the risk areas that we've identified and, and how we're working to address with building owners, building, building owners, managers, cleaning contractors, cleaners and their union through our certification scheme. So the first, the first key risk area is insufficient contract pricing. So current cleaning contracts are not sufficiently priced to, to cover the additional cleaning required to meet new hygiene and safety standards stemming from COVID. So procurers of cleaning services can play a key role here in preventing this situation. Um, the second point is the underlying context of dangerous and substandard work in this industry. So underpayment, unsustainable workloads, high rates of occupational injury, poor quality training, bullying and harassment, insufficient provi provision of chemicals, equipment and personal protective equipment, and things like immigration related threats and coercion all of these were already present in the cleaning industry prior to the pandemic. Part of the reason CAF, CAF exists. So these pre-existing dangerous and substandard working conditions are being amplified during the pandemic. 
And they also have a significant public health consequence additional to the human rights violations that they constitute for workers. So some examples of the dangerous and substandard working conditions that are being um, amplified during COVID are the fact that cleaners are not being provided safeguards to protect themselves from the virus, such as fit for purpose protect, personal protective equipment. Cleaners are sometimes not informed that they're being sent in to clean areas where there's been a known COVID contamination and not always provided with the right PPE to do so. Many cleaners, and this is something that has been going on for a long time and that CAF has been trying to address through the certification scheme. Um, many cleaners can't take paid sick leave when they need to. That may be because they don't have a paid sick leave entitlement. Often it's because they, there are barriers to them actually using that entitlement. Often cleaners are not provided with sufficient quality training on how to carry out their work safely and effectively. Training for cleaners tends to be either online or a document that they have to read and sign before the start of their shift. Often it's pretty much always, it's only in English rather than in translation in community languages. And the training is often expected to be performed outside of cleaners paid working hours, which provides a disincentive to cleaners actually undertaking that training. So on this slide, we've got some quite shocking statistics about the safety picture in the cleaning industry during the initial weeks of the pandemic in Australia. So a survey of over 500 cleaners conducted in March found that 74% of cleaners did not have enough personal protective equipment to do their job safely. 80% did not have enough cleaning equipment to do a quality job and 91% had to rush their work because of insufficient time. So it's not difficult to see what broader public health and commercial repercussions these three issues might lead to, apart from the, the dangerous working conditions for cleaners. A key thing that COVID has amplified, um, or has led to rather, is um, loss of livelihoods for cleaners. So there have been significant contract reductions in shopping centres, office buildings, universities and airports, which have had a severe impact on the livelihoods of cleaners. The average cleaner is an international student from a low or middle income country that works 20 hours a week and earns roughly $540 a week before tax. Most cleaners are ineligible for JobKeeper and JobSeeker and are currently facing severe financial distress if they've been stood down or if they've lost hours. So we know that international students have turned en masse to food banks for assistance, but many, it's feared, will have had no choice but to seek out alternative employment at whatever rate they can get, which exposes them to a highly vulnerable, um, to, to highly vulnerable forms of work that in many cases would fit the quite narrow definition of modern slavery. The final risk area that I'd like to focus on is the fact that workers are unable to speak up. So temporary migrant workers who make up the bulk of the cleaning workforce, so in CBD office buildings, 90% of the cleaning workforce is on a temporary work visa. So they're really reluctant to speak up if they do experience labour rights violations. Um, and the reason they don't speak up is that they fear losing hours or fear losing their job entirely. Um, and because they're excluded from government income support through job seeker or job keeper, uh, it's, they just have to, they make it, they take a calculated risk and, um, and don't speak up. So if we go to, oh, so I'll just um, direct you to some of these quotes um, that speak to the loss of livelihood um, for cleaners. So these quotes were, were gathered at the beginning of the pandemic, so in March, um, before, before lockdown had occurred, um, but cleaners knew that the writing was on the wall, so they knew that they would be, um, that there was no safety net for them, um, and they were just desperate to cling on to hours. So I'll talk a little bit more towards the end of my presentation about what's actually happened um, so if we move to the next slide, so there are a number of ways that we can address, address these risks to workers during COVID-19. Um, so within CAF, we've seen examples of cleaners faring relatively well throughout the pandemic. 
In many cases, they've been able to keep working their normal hours. They've had access to adequate personal protective equipment. They've received ongoing training and they've had the opportunity to raise workplace issues through the CAF worker engagement process. And this has happened when the top, when the top of the supply chain has engaged productively with cleaning contractors and provided a space for cleaners to speak up. So the result in, in these cases where, the, where there's been this supply chain transparency and accountability, the result has been that cleaning services are being delivered to a high standard um, with cleaners rights being respected. I can talk, if, if people have any questions at the end, I can talk about how that works in practice, um, but I'm just conscious of time, so I'll keep pushing on. Um, so in the previous slide, I mentioned the dire picture presented by the survey of over 500 cleaners that was conducted by United Workers Union. At the same time as that survey was being conducted, CAF sent out a coronavirus survey to the 750 odd cleaners working in CAF certified buildings, asking many of the same questions. So the difference in working conditions that comes out through these two parallel surveys is quite stark. So if you consider that 74% of cleaners in non-CAF buildings did not have enough personal protective equipment, in, in our CAF survey, we found that only 8% of cleaners in CAF buildings were reporting this. And while 80% of cleaners in non-CAF buildings did not have enough cleaning equipment to do a quality job, only 3% in CAF buildings reported this. So follow-up engagement that we've done with cleaners in CAF buildings since that time suggests that the 8% who reported not having enough PPE at the start of the pandemic, which in large part was attributable, attributable to global shortages, has reduced considerably. So we've conducted a number of worker engagement meetings since August and there's been no reports. So we've been really careful to check on this. There's been no reports of insufficient personal protective equipment and no overall workload issues. So cleaners in CAF buildings have enough time to do their work. They're working safely and they still have jobs <laughs> for the most part. Um, so the principal issue has been stand downs and cuts to working hours. So Cleaners in CAF buildings have not been entirely shielded from this. There have been, um, cleaners have been required to take annual leave. Um, some have been stood down completely. In many cases, there have been, people have had a reduction to their working hours. And so that's, that has had the effect of placing much of the cleaning workforce on a knife's edge. So the quotes in the previous slides speak to, to the fears that they had at the pandemic, at the beginning, beginning of the pandemic um, when they knew how precarious they were in the supply chain. And so in many cases, these fears have unfortunately been borne out. And so, not in all cases, there have been some shining examples of owners completely retaining um, full service provision at their assets and both ensuring a safe, um, safe space for tenants and for members of the public um, and ensuring that cleaners' livelihoods are, are protected throughout the pandemic. So that's it from me. Thanks for that, Miriam. Um, and it's been, OCCR has been engaging with uh, property owners outside CAF and beyond CAF. Um, and it is significant to note that in our engagements, we've noted that a lot of them cannot account for the additional hours required. Um, by cleaners to kind of keep buildings to a particular standard. I think um, in New South Wales and in other states of Australia, apart from Victoria, where we're back at work and in offices, it's quite concerning to kind of think about whether or not buildings are being cleaned to the proper standard. Um, and as Victoria emerges um, later in the year from lockdown, um, it'll be good to see that some of those provisions that CAF has put in place brought in as well. Um, I'm going to keep moving because I'm conscious of time. Um, so the other industry that we wanted to quickly flag is uh, logistics and warehousing. So logistics and warehousing um, has been one of the hardest hit sectors in terms of COVID-19 transmissions after aged care and abattoirs. So there's been over 300 um, workplace transmissions since the start of the second wave in warehouses in Melbourne. Um, the reason for this is 
to do with the nature of work in warehouses. It's um, high density work, workers are working quite close together. There's a lot, typically a few hundred people in each warehouse that are working together. And often the shift time is staggered. So it's not, you've got overlapping shifts, which means that individual workers are coming into contact with more workers than they would under a single shift. The other issue is around labour hire um, and the fact that um, while warehousing used to be predominantly direct employment um, with labour hire only used for seasonal fluctuations like Christmas, for example, um, there are increasing numbers of labour hire workers on, in warehouses, sometimes upwards of 50%. Now, those workers are often not given enough shifts to um, only work in one location and so they are coming into contact with more and more people. Um, reflecting this is that a requirement for warehouses to stay open as an essential uh, workplace in the stage four lockdown was that employees were prohibited from working at more than one premise and were uh, made to tell their employer that they were only working in a single premise. They were warehouse uh, companies uh, were also required to reduce their peak daily on-site workforce by 33% based on July models. The exception to this was supermarkets reflecting the need to kind of maintain food supply, but other kind of safety measures were brought in place in response to that. Um, just to kind of highlight what the numbers look like um, is that in the, by the first week of August, so in a couple of weeks into the second stage, is that we had 44 coronavirus cases at the Lynn Fox uh, warehouse um, and we had 59 cases in a single Woolworths warehouse in Mulgrave. Today I want to talk briefly about one um, warehouse, which is the one run by uh, Toll Group, which um, on the 7th of August, 300 workers ceased work um, as they can do under the OHS Act. Um, they ceased work in response to um, a couple of COVID cases in the warehouse, um, and they'd raised questions with their employer about um, workplace health and safety, but also to try and get transparency of the number of actual live cases uh, in the warehouse. Toll management refused to share um, the number of cases um, and even the departments in which the cases were located with the workplace health and safety representatives, stating that as the work as the cases were labour hire workers, um, they were not toll employees and therefore the HSRs had no right to that information. The HSRs, um, the health and safety representative, issued a direct, in response to this, issued a direction to cease work pursuant to section 74 of the OHS Act. Um, and in, on the 10th of September, three days after this, uh, WorkSafe issued a provisional improvement notice regarding its failure to properly consult, um, the company's failure to consult with the health and safety reps. And they stated that the company's failure to um, provide workers with the information regarding active cases in the warehouse um, breached the company's duty of care. So the, the, the WorkSafe Victoria basically acknowledged that workers had a right to find out about all active cases in the work site, which is common sense, um, not just those that pertain to their employer, noting that the risk is about the work site and not whether or not um, transmission only in, uh, occurs by who you're employed by. Um, the reason that John, and we're going to call him John because he can't share his name, um, isn't here today is that following uh, the WorkSafe notice, um, workers engaged with the company around further elections over workplace health and safety representatives and having greater workplace involvement um, in uh, pandemic plans. Um, he has since been stood down, uh, allegedly in retaliation for the work um, that had been done in making the complaint to WorkSafe. Um, so we're, this is an issue that we're tracking um, and it is something that has been observed um, globally. Um, it is something that the PRI has noticed in their guidance to investors um, because it is so rife um, in terms of uh, this breach of freedom of association and actual breach of workplace OHS law um, is getting investors to engage about whether or not um, workers have a right to raise safety issues without retaliation. So the issues at Coles and the cease work at Coles is one of 12 uh, cease works that have happened in warehouses in Victoria that ACCR knows of. There may have been more. Um, 
and those cease works are not illegal industrial action. Um, we have engaged a number of companies about the safety precautions that they've brought in place and the necessity of workers taking action. Um, and we've been concerned to note um, the number of times that illegal action has been cited when the, uh, the legislation is quite clear that workers have a right to cease work. Um, and so just to highlight, and I'm not gonna go into that level of detail, but um, all of the various legislation that covers workplaces state that work, uh, that there is a duty of care by employers to provide a health and safety work, a health and safe, healthy and safe workplace, um, and that they must consult with workers on health and safety matters, um, and that workers themselves have a right to collect health and safety reps. And under the act, uh, under the various acts, these reps have legal powers and rights, like that right to cease work. Um, this legislation recognises that often it's the workers themselves on the site that have a better understanding than management of um, the issues on site at the workplace that lead to safety. Um, and so it is issues like physical distancing, um, the provision of PPE, the management of shifts so that you're not getting overlapping shifts and likewise um, that we're being brought up. Um, and so it's probably clear to see that without many of these stop work actions, the number of transmissions that we would have seen in Victoria would have been much higher. Um, and the fact that a lot of what workers were asking for has been codified in regulation under the stage four lockdown requirements is kind of quite significant. Um, just to keep going, because we're uh, running out of time, but um, the other part of the legislation, uh, which is based in research, recognises that WHS plans recognise, as I said, that workers have specific expertise. Um, and highlighting the importance of worker involvement, as I was saying, uh, a US study of the aged care sector found that there was a 30% decrease in mortality rates in aged care and a 42% lower COVID infection rate in nursing homes that had a union presence and active workers that were monitoring OHS and were kind of empowered to kind of raise workplace issues. So we don't have similar research for other sites, but it's probably quite telling based on what you've just seen with CAF around the role of a kind of active an active workplace kind of grouping that this is this will follow on from that. So given this, um, the thing that I kind of want to end on a little bit is that given the significance of workplace COVID infections, we would have expected that there would be reporting on this by companies. Um, we believe that COVID infections, particularly COVID infections that lead to workplace shutdowns, or supply disruptions in the case of warehousing is a form of material disclosure. And it's kind of necessary for investors to understand what transmission is happening to be able to understand the impact that it is having on overall business. So we looked at media reports and WorkSafe reports around lists of COVID-19 cases in work sites in Melbourne. Um, and we did not see that information reflected in company reporting. So of the companies that were listed at the start of this webinar, we reviewed all of their company documents um, for, uh, since, the start of the, uh, since the start of the second wave. Um, only one company, Woolworths, provided specific information about case numbers amongst employees, and you can see that in the on the slide. And that was in an earnings call. It wasn't in a release. To my, it was just kind of something that we found in an earnings call. But I want to draw your attention to the difference in some of those cases between what was reported at Woolworths, Woolworths Warehouse compared to um, the number of cases it reported for its team members. And it kind of indicates that companies, that even when they are reporting, are still only reporting on their direct employees and not the impact on the overall workforce in their, um, not their overall workforce. And I don't wanna call Woolworths out because in fact, the only reason that we can kind of make this comparison is that they're one of the only ones that reported in the first place and other companies are much further behind. Um, and this is something that is not unique to Australia. It's something that's been noticed by partners of ours as we've been working in the UK and the US. And there is just insufficient information for us to assess the amounts of risk to workers and therefore the broader community from transmission. So I'm gonna end with questions. And all of the information that you've heard today is similar information that we have used in developing up uh, a set of questions for investors um, around the brief, uh, around these issues. Um, you can find it at that link there but effectively the questions are grouped into a number of a couple of different areas. One is on workplace 
health and safety and questions that you can ask around whether or not workers are provided with pandemic leave, uh, whether there is retaliation against workers for raising health and safety issues um, and the inclusion of contractors and subcontractors. We've also got a couple of um, questions around responsible contracting that picks up on a number of the points that Miriam raises um, raised in her presentation, um, and so did Angie, around whether or not the work, uh, whether lead companies were reporting on all um, their workforce and what and how they engage there and shared information with labour buyer. <laughs> Um, and finally, we conclude with stuff around the use of government stimulus. So I'm going to finish there um, and leave us with 15 minutes for questions. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, sorry, uh, and I'll just ask the questions for there. And Claire Richards, I see, has put the link in the, the chat. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we've got a question saying that uh, what airport and worked at, it's um, Brisbane Airport. And raised hands, sorry, I'm just gonna quickly do that. All right. Um, sorry, David, I'm gonna allow you to, talk. I'm gonna go to you first, David. Uh, a good presentation, Katie. Um, but I didn't have a question. I don't know why you said my hand was up, but... Oh, okay. It's in the participant section. We're all learning with Zoom. You'd think we'd got it over the top. All right. I'm going to go to um, the next one, which is Lou. Hang on a second. I'm going to mute you, David. <laughs> uh, Lou, uh, you should be able to talk now. Hi. Um, my, my question is, uh, how do you make a distinction between what is just general workplace um, breaches from uh, what's classified as modern slavery under that strict definition. Um, Mim, do, do you want to take that or should I? Um, so I might take that first up, is that I, um, I tend to not make a concrete distinction. Um, I use uh, the metric that a lot of, uh, that a number of academics have put forward, but also Australian border force, which is that there is a spectrum of labour exploitation um, and that workers will, um, they will often fall and become, as they become more vulnerable, they will fall into um, situations that more and more um, reflect modern slavery. There are a couple of characteristics that I guess um, really mark that modern slavery. So um, threats and coercion would be a big one. So as people know, ACCR's work has mostly been focused on horticulture. So we've seen um, threats and coercion where it's either threats of sexual violence or threats of deportation. So that would be quite common in the cleaning industry and Miriam can speak to that. Um, the other is very, very low wages. Um, and, you know, leading to the point, um, some of the stuff that we might be seeing is when you start to intersect low wages with excessive housing costs and transport costs, you end up in situations where workers are earning almost nothing and that curtails their ability to kind of move um, from a work site. And I guess the other stuff that um, we start to look at is unfair recruitment fees and bonded contracts. So there is evidence of um, on farms, for example, of workers having their, in Australia, of workers having their passport taken by the farmers. Um, I think for us, modern slavery becomes a way in to look at these broader lenses of um, exploitation. And maybe Miriam, you can talk a little bit about that relationship between modern slavery and decent work from a CAF perspective. Mm. I mean, that was a perfect answer, Katie. I don't think I've got too much to add. But yeah, I mean, CAF is certainly working more of a premium end of the market. So we, you know, we screen for modern slavery and we, we talk to workers and sort of ask, ask questions um, to sort of um, try and identify if there is anything problem, like anything that really does fall within the strict definition of modern slavery. So we ask about whether they working to pay off a debt to a recruiter or a migration agent. Um, we ask them if they've um, been threatened with deportation and things like that. So um, thankfully, typically uh, the answer is no, or it's no at, the, at their present workplace. Um, but yeah, I think, the, I think 
our approach is certainly to address modern slavery by promoting decent work. So ensuring that, um, you know, that they are, that workers are being paid fairly, that they have a safe workplace and that they're empowered to speak up if anything goes wrong, if they do start to experience dangerous and substandard work. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you have those conditions, it follows that you don't have modern slavery. So I think, yeah, the... I guess I get that they're both bad. It's just there's a strict definition of modern slavery that puts asset owners and you know those people caught by the act under a, an obligation whereas general workplace issues are you know there's a different regime for that that's that's really all i'm getting at i mean the the government's modern slavery guidance does specifically uh, mention the, the spectrum of exploitation and does refer to human rights due diligence, which is what this is effectively. Um, and I guess I would also highlight, um, so we work quite closely with um, academics, Justine Nolan and Martin Borsema, who've published the book um, Addressing Modern Slavery. Um, and what they highlight is because of this spectrum um, of labour exploitation, it's not that modern slavery sits quarantined off from other forms of work. Um, and so, taking a human rights risk perspective um, and that looks at that spectrum allows you to kind of work with workers that are in, le in less vulnerable and coercive conditions to monitor the workplace themselves. Um, and so in some ways by looking at it in that broader sense, it allows for a risk mitigation strategy that, um, yeah, that, that uses the people that you've got on site already. So that's probably what I, yeah, that's how to look at it. But I understand those requirements under the Act and the reporting, but I guess there's also legal requirements to have legal minimums paid as well. Um, so I'm just going to get to the next question because we're short on time. Um, so across the ASX 100, what are your view the most promising and most egregious examples? Um, so oh, that's a tricky one. So I guess what we're seeing is... Um, there's a couple of standouts. I mean, we've been engaging with property owners within the, like property owners as REITs um, recently, and probably one of the standouts in terms of egregious is Centre Group that does not have any recording of kind of hours. Um, they, you know, the parent company of Westfield. Um, and when we've engaged with them about how they um, check for contractor hours with their cleaners to ensure that people are paid legally, um, they have that's not how they contract and so they contract based on standards and not based on hours now that's already concerning based on what we know about underpayments in the sector but when they've tried to increase hours for COVID or do a redistribution of work to move it away from like areas that under COVID are low trafficked um, to areas that need higher degrees of cleaning it means that we've got no way of really assessing um, whether or not those workers are being fairly paid for the additional work that's required. Um, I guess that's a standout within that, but and probably um, on that side, I guess we're not really seeing um, leaders yet within that listed space, but we are seeing leaders with investors in their um, private in their private kind of equities. So CBUS Super, for uh, CBUS Property, for example, um, signing up to the cleaning accountability framework and you know agreeing to kind of certify their whole portfolio recently, I guess would be a leader in that sense. Um, and I guess within the warehouses is we've seen um, where we've seen greater action is where there's greater visibility um, and exposure to customers. We've seen greater action on COVID protection for workers. So super, like front facing and customer facing staff in supermarkets, there's more attention to um, COVID protections, but in the warehousing, it's been a bit slower to act. Although um, we have seen some movements eventually on that side as well. Um, and I would probably, and meat production has been very slow to act, but that's not ASX 100. Uh, other questions? Um, and great. Uh, cool. Uh, so is there, if there's other, and I just want to highlight there's a comment, but not a question, just kind of 
flagging that there's been a lot of COVID cases at Qantas, um, with Qantas trying to downplay the number of cases among flight attendants and also people at Adelaide Airport. And so, um, you know, as we start to fly again, um, as the, the attendee reflected, then it is really important that we do look at this. And I think as the economy work, opens up again, I think this reporting is going to become more significant. We're looking at the UK where we've seen, I guess, now we're coming into, again, a wave after. Um, and so what we want to try and avoid, I guess, is a kind of opening up and lockdown and sequential. And the only way we're going to do that is if we have sufficient information to um, monitor companies and ensure that these protections are being put in place. Um, if there are other questions, I'll give you a couple of minutes, but otherwise I think, uh, let me have a look if there's, sorry, in the hands up. And I think that's, that might be all our questions. Um, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, this webinar will be, uh, the brief will be circulated to everyone after the webinar. Uh, we will be circulating um, the recording of the webinar. Uh, we may not be able to circulate it with Angie's um, statements. We've just got to get a couple of things cleared at the moment, but um, so it might take us a, a couple of days to circulate that, but please feel free to set, um, follow that on. Um, if you have any other questions for either of us, Miriam or myself, or about the engagements that we're doing, feel free to shoot them through over email. Um, you'll get that email in the original sign up. But thanks very much to everyone for attending and thanks Miriam for getting on the call today. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone.